I think we'll get started. Maybe a couple more people will trickle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. I'm Emily Buckbear. I work for Lane County Public Health in the Prevention Program. And this is Doug Gooch, my colleague. And he works. And I'm, I'm working on problem gambling prevention and then also helping out with suicide prevention and alcohol prevention. Yeah, and my focus is alcohol and drug prevention. So we put together this presentation for you, uh, which uh, we've loving, lovingly called Teen Proofing Your Home. Not as in uh, getting rid of teens, <laughs> but more so to ask the question, when you brought your baby home, your child home from the hospital, what were some things that you did in your home to uh, child-proof your home? Does anybody uh, have covers on. covers on sockets? Anything else? Cabinet locks. Yeah, yeah. Door handles, you put dangerous things away. Mm -hmm. items forward. You put the dangerous things away. So you're thinking kind of uh, proactively from a preventative standpoint, what are some things I need to be thinking about because a baby is coming home, right? And so we asked the question, what would it look like for you to teen proof your home now that you have a teenager? who's going to be living with you. What are some things that you would be thinking about to make it a healthy and safe environment? The alcohol away. Putting the alcohol somewhere in a cabinet if you have alcohol in the home. That's one thing. Controls on the internet and TVs and phone, phone. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we're gonna be talking about the internet and phones also and the, the things that we can do um, to protect uh, teens from uh, you know, getting into getting into the trouble on the internet and that kind of thing. Uh, what I like to start with is talking about why we even want to do any kind of prevention with youth in the first place and why we focus on youth when it comes to prevention and that's because uh, their brain is still developing and it is a very vulnerable 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 time for um, for the brain in, in its development so it uh, is the process of it developing is from the basically the back of the brain all the way to the front and until they're in their um, young adult stage their brain is still developing and so the last part of the brain to develop is the one that has um, some of these very key functions which include decision making, impulse control, um, and things of that nature. So I don't have a youth at home, but I know some of you do. So what are maybe some things that you have noticed about um, decision making skills with, with youth? They can be kind of random. Kind of random, right? So the, the phrase, what, what were you thinking, can come up, right? Uh, and that has to do with uh, basically that the brain isn't talking to the different parts yet. So you have uh, rational thinking that's totally developed, um, knowledge about different things. Like this, if some, a parent was saying earlier, I might say it's not healthy, but if that might not make a difference. Well, so a, a youth will know something's not healthy, but then that part of the brain might not be talking to the part that um, has impulse control in the moment, what am I going to be doing? And so um, all of these things are affected by drug and alcohol use and other kind of addictive behaviors. So it's something that we focus on in health because if we can get kids to be as healthy as they possibly can be, then we can have as healthy of a community as we possibly can have. Um, and another important thing I think is if anybody has somebody in their life who has a chemical dependency to something, substance use disorder or an addiction of some kind, um, they might not be the most empathetic person. And that is because that's also one of the very last parts of the brain to develop. It's control, it has control of um, uh, empathy. And so people who are struggling with addiction issues might not seem like selfless people or very self-aware. And it's really because their, their brain has been stunted. Um, and that they might not be able to imagine what it's like to be in your shoes or to think about something besides them and their um, addiction. So here's a, a photograph of a developing brain. And you can see that at age five, it's still very much so growing. And then it keeps growing until, what's the number up on the screen? Until you're 20. 
And most researchers are going to agree that it's not done developing and in the clear until 25. So what's the legal age limit for marijuana now that it's legal? It's 21. And then we just changed it for tobacco. In the state of Oregon, it's 21 now. And why, why do you think uh, the government is interested in making it so that you can't have access to this thing until after you're 21? Exactly. It's not a number that's pulled out of a hat. It's not 18 when you can vote or get into the military. It's 21. And there's a very specific reason for that. Because research shows us that if the brain isn't done developing until you're 25, uh, you're going to have a much less likely time becoming chemically dependent on a substance if you wait until your brain is done. And that's because it's a half-day brownie. It's not done yet. It needs time to finish, you know, before you start pouring chemicals into it and uh, interrupting the processes. And so this graph up here, I think, is the most important thing to take away from this presentation, which is that the age of initiation directly correlates to whether or not you're going to need treatment. So at age 13, the likelihood of you becoming chemically dependent, having an addiction to a substance, is almost double if you start at 13 than if you started in your 20s. And so that's why we're so interested in changing the age of initiation, because if your brain is done developing, the likelihood of addiction is gonna be much, much less. It's still there, there's other components to be worried about. Do you have a family history um, of addiction? Is it, you know, a, is there a genetic component to it? Um, have you experienced some serious childhood trauma? For instance, did you lose a parent when you were very young? Um, things of that nature. Or when people talk about the military and 18-year-olds um, needing to have access to tobacco, the military is actually very against 18-year-olds um, using tobacco because they know that people in the military are going to have traumatic experiences. They're going to be exposed to a lot of things. Um, and that's going to make them much more likely to become addicted. So one big takeaway for me would be age of initiation. So here's some local data that we were given from the school district to use. Uh, and what, from this graph, would you say is the number one substance that um, Pleasant Hills uh, students are accessing and using? Uh, alcohol, right? Alcohol would be the number one. And it seems a little higher than the state average, I would say, right? I would like to say that this is data from 2017. It's a snapshot. It's one class. It's 11th graders that are no longer in school who took this survey. But it is a, a, a pretty good picture of these substances are being used by the youth in this community. That is something that we know for a fact. Um, and then what would be another takeaway from, from this slide? E-cigarettes are definitely more popular than the substance, uh, than the cigarette traditional combustible tobacco. The thing that I find interesting is that we ask about marijuana on this survey and we ask about alcohol, but we're not asking about tobacco. We ask about the, di the different types of tobacco because e-cigarettes are still tobacco. The nicotine in them comes from tobacco. And then uh, you have tobacco and cigarettes. So if you combine cigarettes, with e-cigarettes, suddenly you have 41% use. So um, it's pretty shocking to a public health expert because for the last five decades, the uh, tobacco use has been, just been dropping in the general population as we find out how dangerous it is. And we've done so much to um, uh, make it so that advertising isn't happening so much to the general population. Um, so it's been going down. And then with youth, it's been dropping off very quickly. And so it was down to maybe about 5% of teens would say that they were using tobacco. And then with e-cigarettes and the introduction of that, uh, we've seen it skyrocket. In Lane County as a whole, from 2013 to 2017, we saw a 250% increase in use, which is significant. <laughs> we would say that's significant. And a, and a big worry, because uh, nicotine is a highly addictive substance. Um, and so if youth are using it and they're using it before 
a certain age, we know the likelihood of them not being able to stop is, is great, very great. So. I have a question. Yeah. I don't remember. What year did marijuana become legal? 2016. Oh, was it that long ago? Okay, I was wondering how that factored into like the marijuana, but it was it that okay? Yeah, marijuana. I don't know if it like was higher now because it's legal, but mm -hmm. uh, it is higher. Uh, that's a complex question because uh, because the trend of substance use has been trending down slowly, oh, okay. but as we do things like. Uh, make it so that tobacco corporations can't um, advertise on television or have their product in movies. As we start to make those environmental changes, we see less and less use. Um, so it's been trending down. What we can say is that the, the marijuana was trending down and then it stopped. So we can see from that that more youth are probably using, but um, it, it hasn't you know, gone up just yet. But that is a really good question. We do know that youth have a lot more access to marijuana than they used to, socially and le legally. They're not supposed to be able to buy from dispensaries, but we do know that um, they're having cases where uh, a minor is sent in to purchase and um, it's sold to them. So that is an issue. So I'm going to focus a little bit on e-cigarettes, and if you have any specific questions, so just uh, stop me, and you can go ahead and ask. These slides are from the CDC. They were nice enough to share them with me because they're pretty, and I'm not a graphic designer. Um, so what we have here is on the far left are, are the original kind of uh, popular e-cigarettes and, and vapes. So whole e-cigarette and other e-cigarettes that have um, most, most of these mods have re refillable tanks. There's kind of a learning curve with them. You have to uh, fill the tank with the, with the e-cig uh, vapor liquid, e-liquid. E um, you have to go out and buy that. You have to replace some of the parts on a regular basis. Um, so there's kind of a learning curve when it comes to those things. But the e-cigarettes were kind of a revolution in one way because they're so easy to use. They come with uh, little pods that are pre-filled. So they're more expensive in general to have because um, the pods cost money and you have to go and keep buying these pods in order to use them. Um, but they have basically zero learning curve to them. You, you purchase it and you can just attach it and you're ready to go. And there's no heat required, right? Like yeah. You don't have to light anything. You don't have to light anything. No, really, technically, I'm saying vape, but technically it's an aerosol that you're in inhaling. Yeah. An aerosol that has nicotine in it and um, most of the time heavy metals. Yeah? So you mentioned in the first picture you see the vape, the, the mods, tanks yeah. and mods. So do you see it with the metal? You see the smoke? Oh, yeah. the, oh, yeah, the aerosol, the vape, the aerosol. You can, but it's much, much, much less noticeable. It's a much smaller, you know, cloud of aerosol. And in fact, Juul is, I think, coming out with a new line that's supposed to be even less noticeable. It's all about being able to be discreet. Um, they're very tiny. You can hide them anywhere in, in a pocket or basically in your hand. And then um, if, if somebody were to inhale it and not exhale, you probably wouldn't even see anything at all, which is the opposite of the tanks and mods. I mean, it's just like huge clouds of aerosol coming out. So, yeah. But those are some of the popular models. And then we're not seeing um, very much disposable e-cigarette use yet. The Jewels and um, models that are like the Jewel are the most popular because they're the easiest to use. And the jewels are the ones that were described as being able to get like a USB uh, mm -hmm. drive and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On, on first glance or Yeah, there's a picture of it up there. The the um, the charger is actually a USB and you can plug it into any of your ports and, and be charging it. And it does it looks like a USB but it's kind of long. Mm -hmm. um, it's very easily recognizable if you know what you're looking for. Yeah. So, back it up a little bit. There we go. 
Is it going to stay? Is it going to stay though? Okay. Um, so the thing that is so different about the the next evolution of the uh, e-cigarettes is that they've changed the way that nicotine is acting in your body and nicotine is affecting your body. So uh, vapes and mods, the, the tanks, the original kind of generation, you would have a physical negative side effect the moment you use them. So the one thing about cigarettes was you would be smoking it and then you would uh, get maybe a sore throat. There would be physical side effects kind of right away that would discourage you to some degree to use it. And then there's the taste and all of that. Um, but with these, uh, they have no real physical consequences to them. So not only do you have that very low learning curve where uh, somebody can just take them and, and load them up and, and go out and start using them on a regular basis with really nothing to kind of figure out. Um, but there's no physical side effect either. So the original vape, which they call free base nicotine, it would give you a sore throat. You know, it would make you cough because you'd be inhaling it. But what they did is they developed a, I want to say they, tobacco corporations, developed a, a type that doesn't have those kinds of physical consequences anymore. And they call it nicotine salt. And so in these newer versions, the Jewels and the Altos and, and things like that, they, um, they're very smooth. You don't notice them going into your lungs. You don't notice them coming out of your lungs. So you don't have that initial physical reaction from your body um, that, that is kind of like uh, a lot of people who would use it for the first time would go, oh, I don't like that. I don't like that side effect. Um, and then the other thing about them would be that a cigarette has a natural ending. You know how much you've had. Same with um, chewing tobacco. You know how much you've had when it comes to um, vape. It, it, there's no limit. You just keep using it and, and using it and, until it's gone. And by that time, you've had a lot of nicotine compared to these other um, other ways of doing it. So. They say that, um, researchers are saying that a jewel pod, for example, has an entire pack of um, cigarettes nicotine in it. And the youth that died from using jewel specifically had used four pods um, in one day. And so you don't have those, you, know, you, you, wouldn't know, you wouldn't really be able to do that with cigarettes or chewing tobacco. You get physically ill much before that. But with, with this item, you might get nauseous, you might um, shake, you know, um, but you won't have that kind of like physical aversion aversion to it. So that's why they're so insidious is because they are very easy to learn how to use and then um, there, there's really no barriers to, to, to using it all day, every day at, at a much higher and higher and higher rate, really. So I'll talk a little bit about why. Yeah, what? Oh, two. Yep. We'll talk a little bit about why we're concerned about this with youth. Is that um, we know that Jewel, in particular, I'm picking on them, but they're kind of like you know the Apple brand of, of e-cigarettes. Specifically, Jewel was targeting youth in their advertising. They were paying um, Instagram influencers to use their product. Uh, on on Instagram, so you can you can use social media influencers, people who are popular, people who you fo follow on a regular basis, celebrities and things like that. You can pay them to use your product, and then kind of get it out there with that kind of advertising. And they also were using advertising that was uh, extremely colorful, uh, showed really healthy people dancing and having a good time, and it was pretty obvious to anyone who was watching what they were doing. It was like you know, the tobacco ads that had been banned. It's like we peeled back all that work that we'd done to, to make it so that they weren't targeting youth anymore, um, which is very sad, down to the fact that they had flavors, which um, was one of the first things they worked on with tobacco because flavors are so appealing to youth. The tobacco flavor is not as appealing to youth as mango or mint or something like that. So essentially the model that the tobacco uh, companies use is that they put out the advertising um, that there is this product that you would want to be using and here's why because look at these people they're having so much fun and then the flavors are what get the youth kind of interested in it because it's going to taste good 
it's mango flavored or it's mint flavored. Um, and if it wasn't flavored, it might not be so appealing. And then what gets them coming back is that it has nicotine and nicotine is one of the most highly addictive drugs that we have. Um, it, it pretty much right away changes the brain chemistry um, to create a dependency and you can um, build a tolerance to it extremely fast. So that's another reason why having the um, nicotine salt is so insidious because it's already a product that people are going to use a lot of and then need more pretty soon after they start using it. Um, so that's a, that's a big bummer. And is it, it yeah? Does the nicotine in the, in the vape pens, does it react the same as a traditional, you know, cigarette? Like react how? Like the, like the, the high or the, the feeling that you yeah. get after that. It's, it's the same, feeling. basically the same exact product, but just in a, oil liquid form rather just in than the vapor form yeah actual in the, in the e liquid yeah form. yeah so it's it's like a feeling of like a, it's like a slight feeling of euphoria um it's people say it's kind of like barely noticeable but it's a, it's the same it's the same as a, a cigarette okay. um and in that in that it has many of the same health consequences of, of, of a cigarette because nicotine itself damages your body it doesn't need to be um, combustible to have those long-term health effects. So even if um, e-liquids didn't have heavy metals in them, which a lot of them do um, through the process of using the vapes, even if uh, that were the case, and this was being marketed as a way to quit cigarettes, which a lot of a lot of um, companies are trying to say that it's just a it's just a way to quit using um, cigarettes for adults and it's not for youth. Even if that were the, the case which I do not believe it is. It, nicotine um, is really bad for your blood pressure. Um, a lot of people who uh, use nicotine end up having heart problems because it, it basically, I don't know, Sue, you could jump in here. Beth, you could jump in here. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the health effects that it has on your body are the same. Yeah. But that's a good question. And I also want to put in a plug that a lot of the times the folks that I talk to don't think that advertising works, which I find fascinating because tobacco companies spend like nine million dollars. I'm not I'm not a tobacco specialist. I'm an alcohol and drug specialist, but they spend billions of dollars per year on advertising. So if advertising did not work, those large corporations would not be doing that in the first place. We really do see advertisements and then. Um, not now, I'm not gonna run out of here and go buy something, right? If I see a, a mattress ad, I'm not gonna run out and go get that mattress. And I might even think that that advertisement is super stupid. Okay. But for whatever so reason, the way that our brain works, so once we've seen it, when I am going to buy a mattress, I'm going to probably remember that advertisement. And based on that information, I'm gonna make my purchase. So it's not for, like right now, no one runs out and buys something that they're seeing advertising in the moment, but it's for later. And then the number of times that you're exposed to it builds up. And um, I just wanted to say advertising works. So it's something that we want to look at um, for reducing use by the general popu population and youth included. Um, and we definitely don't want advertising targeting youth because why? They need to decide what they're going to buy. Mm -hmm. You go into a store and have no idea what brand you might choose or something you've never done before. Mm -hmm. You're going to go for specific foods, like children's cereal, as if children can't just eat cereal, but like they need this specific kind for kids, and then they advertise to kids. It's just, um, and that's what, and kids are very, the younger you are, the more vulnerable you're going to be to advertising messages, for sure. So I think that that's something that's important. Um, so this is kind of like the CDC summary of why uh, why e-cigarettes are an epidemic and why they're such a risk to to, our, to us as a community. Basically, there have been poisonings where children have gotten into um, you know e-liquid packages, especially if they're um, sweet. And they're all kind of sweet because they're all floating in um, like this 
vegetable glycerol, which is naturally sweet. So all of them kind of have this sweet flavor, but they'll be cotton candy flavored and, and other things like that. And so um, little kids have definitely gotten into them and drank them and then had poisoning, nicotine poisoning from them. So there's that. Um, we're re-glamorizing tobacco, even though we've worked so hard to not have tobacco be glamorized. Um, so that's kind of like going backwards in time. Um, it, it discourages people who smoke from using actual cessation methods that have been shown to work. In particular, um, I don't know about Alto, but uh, Juul doesn't have a 0% or a 1% or a 2%. It doesn't have a step system. So when you're quitting um, a, you know, tobacco, you're using the gums and the lozenges and the other FDA approved ways of, of kind of like stepping down and, and slowly using less, but um, it can't be a cessation product if you don't so even make um, less nicotine in the product. Yeah, you have a question? What's glamorizing? Glamorizing, um, it's basically making it look cool. So that, that whole Instagram influencer thing or um, a celebrity, you know, if, it's, it's a, if a celebrity is, is yeah, it's making it seem popular, making it seem like something you would want to do. But that is a really good question. And then, um, it's, so it's a, not a cessation method, so it's not really going to help uh, smokers quit if they're a smoker, or, uh, chew, chewing tobacco users quit. Um, in fact, typically they will start co-using. So somebody will say, okay, I'm going to stop using chew. I'm going to switch to vape because I believe that vape is healthier than chew and this will help me quit. And then um, we see that they start using both. Like they'll vape for a while and then they'll still be hanging out with their friends who chew. So they'll chew and vape and now they're using both. And the, and the vape is so addictive and so easy to use that um, it's just making the tolerance higher and higher for nicotine. Um, it's, re it's leading to relapses among people who have stopped using because they think that it's safer, potentially. Um, and yeah. All the commercials that I've seen, even like, uh, I don't know, it's regular uh, stations or the stations, you know, trying yeah. to use it to quit smoking. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot lately, <laughs> like, yeah, I'm surprised. Yeah, well, I think that. Um, uh, Juul in particular, but just you know, tobacco companies are kind of like trying to trying to sell you the story that what it is is it's for adults because they don't want um, any kind of regulatory crackdown on it. Um, because if they argue that, like the argument is typically that it is my right as an adult to smoke or to chew. I can use tobacco. It's my right, and you cannot take that right away from me. And I wholeheartedly agree with that because that's that is the case. Um, but typically, that argument will be made, and it's protecting um, companies that are marketing towards youth, creating products that are easy for youth to use, and um, uh, making them appealing to youth by making them flavored. You know, most adults don't really want bubblegum flavored um, things, but they are. You know, they're making bubblegum flavored e liquid, and who is that really for? You know, so yeah. So I don't know about that. Um, so some tips are clear limits and expectations. Essentially, as a family, decide what you're comfortable with and what you're not comfortable with, and then you stick to it. Uh, you know, a lot of parents who have kids who are using tobacco are tempted to uh, let vape be something that kids do as an alternative. And uh, if you think it's healthier, I can totally see how that would be appealing. But the fact of the matter is it's much more addictive and it's not healthier, as we're seeing from recent trends. There's, um, they're not entirely sure what's happening yet, but we have 450 cases of uh, a mysterious lung disease <coughs> that is associated with um, vaping. So we know that there are some pretty intense consequences that are happening from people who are using it on a regular basis. And like you said, you don't really know how much you're actually taking in. Yeah, there's no, no idea. Yeah. Or a cigarette, you know how much you're taking in. 
Yeah, and it's not being regulated at all. Uh, the the, the the e-liquid that you can purchase will save zero percent on the label, and they've tested it, and it has nicotine in it. Um, so it's not really being nobody's really watching to make sure that they're doing what they say that they're doing. For those those cases you were talking about, are they do they tend to be more of a nicotine based issue or a marijuana based issue? Do you know? I don't think we have the evidence for that yet. I do know that the death from that one youth was from using the, the pods. Um, I'm fairly certain about that. So we have had death from from nicotine. Um, and then, yeah, there, there have been cases of, of definitely of marijuana. Um, it's, it's hard to tell right now. They're trying to figure out what in particular it is. Um, and a lot of that has to do with we've never put vegetable glycerol inside people's lungs before, you know? And, and then there's other things as well. I've, I've been reading reports about how vitamin E might be associated with it. We just don't know because we've never done it before. But I can say that landlords are paying close attention to um, vaping inside their apartments that they're renting out because in, inside the, the walls, if somebody is using it regularly, it's coating the walls. Right. Well, it's not oil. It's like hardened. It's like oh. it's like lysol. You know, the expelling, the aerosol is you know, is hardening on the walls, and so that's an apartment. It's a lot bigger than a set of lungs. So you can just imagine that maybe something is happening that that's not great to the lungs if, if you're inhaling aerosol on a regular basis. Yeah. If you're gonna get to this, it's okay. Yeah. But we always throw out secondhand smoke. So oh yeah. How does we don't know yet. Yeah, we don't know yet. We don't even have studies on what's happening to the person who's who's using. So yeah, but um, um, it is a good point. You don't know if, if you're in the car and somebody else has the window up and the aerosol is coming out. I would imagine, and so I work for public health, so I'm always going to be more cautious than other people are, but I would imagine that there could be something in that that you don't want to be inhaling. Yeah, yeah, yeah we just don't know yet. Um, so then another couple of tips would be to communicate and to ask without judgment and to listen and um, let people, let your uh, teenager, youth, whoever's in your life vent about, you know, what they're going through or their feelings about it. Um, but again, having consistent messaging, having some fam some clear set family rules about what expectations are around around use, you know. Um, a lot of times I'll talk to parents and then uh, it's, depending on the parent, they'll say alcohol is at least not marijuana. Or they'll say marijuana is at least not alcohol. Or it will be that um, e-cigarettes are not cigarettes, so you know, this is the thing that's less harmful. But I always stop and ask, why are we having a question about what's less harmful for a teenager? You know, it's, it's another thing when somebody has uh, made it through their teenager years to adulthood and, you know, then they can, then they have all of the um, brain capacity and experience and know-how to kind of navigate things for themselves and they're gonna make mistakes but like, why can't we just get them to that point, not doing the less harmful kind of conversation? I think that that's a logic that teenagers will use on parents, and it's like, let's not even, not even go there. Why are we talking about what's less harmful? It, because the word harmful is in that sentence, so I'm kind of concerned with that. Um, and then if you have substances in your home, you want to be thinking about safely storing them. So. Um, there are pill bottles that you can get for marijuana to put them in there that are uh, hard for little kids to get to. There are safes and codes and different things that, that you can use. Um, and the same with, it's just like your liquor cabinet, you wanna think about locking that up and storing it. Prescription drugs, you wanna be making sure that those are out of sight and um, put somewhere where maybe not your child, but a friend visiting, um, even realtors will tell people when they're selling a house to put your prescription drugs somewhere safe and locked up because people will go through your medicine cabinet and look for, um, you know, opiates or other kind of prescription drugs if that's something that they are looking for, you know. 
Um, and never store prescription drugs in a bathroom because the humidity, the humidity is not good for your prescription, for the pills. So just, uh, you know, have a spot where you put things that you don't want other people getting to because they're for you and not for other people. That would be my thoughts on that. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Doug. All right. <clears throat> awesome. So, so we know you came here tonight, I think, about vaping, right? I mean, that's why I think we're here. <clears throat> but we do, um, I think in Lane County Public Health, we kind of have a philosophy that everything is connected in some way. And so uh, Emily kind of talked about that, that we're talking a little bit about team proofing your home. So I, again, we're going to skip, we're going to skip rocks here and just kind of skim on the surface. But we do want to cover um, just three or four other things. Um, and we'll do this at a very surface level. Um, but again, these are things that um, as we start to think about because <clears throat> you have teenagers in your home, yes, vaping is a concern, but there's also some other concerns, and we just want to give you some basic information about that so you can make decisions as parents about how to, <clears throat> you know, how to handle these things. Is it this way? Is this the point? I just give it a time. Okay. It takes a second. Oh, it does? Maybe. Do you, <clears throat> need, do you need some wine? I think I'm okay. okay. Yeah, I got this. There's a drinking bath. I'm going to try it one more time. There you go. Oh, you got it. Oh, awesome. Cool. So, it, you know, one of the things we, <clears throat> these are things that are beginning to um, emerge. We've been looking at uh, research-wise for a while. So as you probably know, uh, all of us are on, all, all of us are participating in screen time a lot. Nowadays, I have this thing right here, my, my iPhone that's uh, with me all the time. And, um, certainly I'm uh, using that quite a bit. Some of the research that we know right now is that actually kids, youth, are spending an average of more than seven hours a day looking at, at, at screens. That's a lot of time, right? And experts are recommending actually that at the very most they get two hours per day, right? We know some of this is in schools, they're, they're looking at screens, but there's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, there's, we're seeing some physical impacts for, for our teenagers who are on their, on their screens uh, a lot. <clears throat> Um, and we're also seeing uh, there's some correlation with mental health uh, issues that are happening with us, which we'll talk about here in just a couple of minutes. Do you want to say 95% of teens say they have access to a smartphone, right? So we, I don't think that's no surprise to all of us. And actually, I think it's starting to feel like that's a necessity, right? Our, our, our culture, our, our communities are moving that way. And, I, and by no means are we meaning to be anti-smartphone or anything like that. There's actually a ton of value. I, I love this thing. It does all kinds of good things for, for my life. But again, this is one of those things we just want to consider how much time are we spending on that and recognizing that, hey, there are some negatives that come along with this and just being thoughtful about that. And I, and I would emphasize, right, we're talking about teens, but those negatives apply to us as adults as well. Um, and then, again, I think this number is really a key for us. 45% of teenagers say that they are online almost constantly, right? That's how they describe it. And then I looked at the data, almost to 90. So we take another 45% or so. <clears throat> I think it was 44% who said at least that they're on them several times a day, right? So it's actually a very small percentage of teens who aren't uh, looking at their screens at least frequently, right, throughout the day. <clears throat> um, the research is telling us there's actually mounting evidence that screen time is linked to obesity. Um, so again, I think this is about um, being in front of a screen, not moving, not doing those things. There's a lot of concerns that come from that. There is some research that's telling us now that it's impacting sleep. So I've been hearing this a lot lately, this, this thing about blue light, right? So the stuff that's coming from your screen, uh, and, and people telling us, hey, don't, you know, give yourself a break between when you look at your phone and when you lay down and go to sleep because of that. So there is some research that's saying, hey, this is impacting sleep. We actually know that sleep's super important for humans, right? And especially for teens, they really need that rest. I also think there's, there's probably some evidence that it's impacting sleep because they're just, I, I look back in the day, back when I was a kid, and there were those kids who were in their bedroom with the, with the book and a flashlight under the blanket and they didn't want their parents to know they were reading a book. I think it's the same, right? We're, we're on the phone, we're texting with friends, we're doing some of those kind of things. Uh, they, just, they just get in the way of getting to bed um, when, we, when we need to. 
Uh, research is linking screen time also to behavioral problems that we're seeing in teens, a loss of social skills. I think, again, I, I don't want to say, we don't have evidence that screen time is causing this, this but we just have, a, we have research right now that says there's a correlation, right? So somebody could argue that, hey, this social skill is actually youth with lower social skills are going into a digital world to try to avoid contact, right? We don't know that. Hopefully the research will, um, <clears throat> will spell that out for us a little better in the future. But again, this is just to give you the information. And then the, the Mayo Clinic there, you'll see one of the things that I know they're really, really concerned about is just that kids are on their screens and not out playing, right? So, and, and that there's a lot of uh, just legitimate benefits to, to youth and, and kids and honestly us as adults being out and playing and interacting and, and doing those things. So again, some concern there. Uh, some teen proofing ideas we have around this. First of all, we would say it's, it's actually really important for us to preview uh, programs, games, and apps. We're actually learning uh, about some apps out there. Emily kept using this word insidious, right, which I love. I had to Google it while we were back there to make sure I knew what it meant. But, uh, but yeah, there are some apps and some things out there that I would classify as insidious, right, where, where teens are, are involved and, and there's conversations that are taking place. It's just a really important uh, thing for us to be mindful of that. Again, seeking out interactive options that engage your child. Hopefully we're doing that, but making sure they have physical things that they're doing, not just in, in a digital world. There's parental controls uh, that you can implement to kind of monitor what's uh, being seen out there. Uh, this is a big one, I think. We do this in our home, a shared space for media and online. We do that. I know uh, <clears throat> I'm a parent, and one of the things that, that I do is I try to set uh, very similar expectations for my teens that I have for myself. So I don't want to ask them to live their life in a way that I'm that I'm also not willing to do in some way. And so we actually try to keep all of our computers and all of that in a space where family is, and that's just there. And so it's kind of an agreed upon uh, thing that we have going in our home. Again, this is just one of those ideas that, that you can do. Um, asking, Emily touched on this. Um, again, just opening conversation with our teacher. We would argue that that's maybe one of the most important things to do on any of these issues. So whether it's vaping or we're having conversations about drugs and alcohol, we're having conversations about social media, online activities, keeping that conversation going with our teens, keeping a relationship there, really, really key, and just talking with them and sharing information. It's really awesome that you're here, that you've involved your kids here to get this information. I think that's really important that you have the information so you can have these conversations so applaud you for, for doing that. <clears throat> um, we also know with social media, there comes an increased risk of cyberbullying. So that's one of the things we're saying. And again, I want to say we are not anti-social media. We've actually heard from teens that for a certain percentage of teens, social media actually helps them be more connected. So that we're just, that it's not all negative by any means. But we do know that uh, social media is being linked to depression and anxiety. I actually just read some research last week that said that the depression and anxiety spike that we're seeing among our youth right now coincides almost exactly with when the first iPhone was released. So that's super interesting, right? We're not saying that for sure that that's a link, because I, I think... So real quick here, and we'll move off this and jump into a couple other things. Do you want to show the, what data show us? So this is from, uh, this is pretty recent, 2018. This is Pew uh, Research Center. So you'll see what teens are mostly using in the, in the social media world is YouTube, Instagram, and Snapchat. A few years ago, we started, um, we started a, a